Good morning. I'm Master Sergeant Haynes, and welcome to today's developmental special duty webcast. We got a lot of good information um, to provide for you today, and we surely do welcome all the questions. The more questions, the better we can help educate you on our process. Good morning. I'm Tech Sergeant Metzger. I'm one of the uh, DSD assignment NCOs, and good morning. I'm Sergeant Brooke Carey, and I'm another one of your DSD assignment NCOs. Good morning, I'm Sergeant Tabor, uh, First Sergeant Functional Assignment Manager up here at AFPC, working alongside the DSD team. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to talk about DSD. What is DSD all about? Where did it come from? So in 2013, the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, he wanted to develop this program to make sure that we're um, getting the best of the best when it comes to these special duties. These special duties are going to represent the enlisted corps and Air Force on a national stage, okay? We have 10 special duty identifiers, and these 10 uh, DSD positions, we have three that are local hires, and um, we have the rest of them are going to be your PS PCS. So for the local hires, we're going to break it down. We have Airman Family Readiness, that's going to be one of your local hires. We have Airman Dorm Leader. And then we also have your career assistance advisor. And to include ALS2, right? Yes, yes, ALS. Okay. And also, um, don't, don't forget that um, just because you are nominated for a local hire position, if there's a local hire position at a base that we cannot fill, we will look at everybody who was um, nominated for a local hire and PCS them to that place. Awesome. Great. So then we have a list of your PCS. DSD positions. Those include the PME instructors like NCOA Academy. We also have the first sergeants, um, honor guard, recruiters, NTLs, the military training instructors, and the, the military training leaders as well. And then the United States Air Force Academy, Academy military trainers. So those are your PCS um, positions that um, we have for DSD. Okay, and just to piggyback on that, when we talk about Honor Guard, it's actually the U.S. Air Force Honor Guard. It's not base level Honor Guard. I just wanted to throw something else in there too real quick, uh, you know, in reference to the, the first sergeants and how the selections and assignments go. Uh, as you mentioned, we have uh, as a PCS effort for uh, some of the, the eight series uh, DSDs, but we also look to do the, uh, the local hires first for PCAs and, um, and, you know, overseas and in the CONUS as well. Awesome. All right. All right, moving on to the actual DSD cycles. So we have two DSD cycles a year. We have the fall and we have the spring. We are currently in spring 2019. Um, during each cycle, there's actually four different phases that we go through. Right now, we're in the nomination phase, and we'll talk about that a little later in our um, briefing. But the actual Spring cycle began in April of this year, and we had a lot of behind the scene um, efforts going on. We worked directly with each um, career field CFM um, to ensure that we get the CFM releases that were required. And when I say CFM, that's career field managers for all of you. Um, we just um, started the nomination process, so we'll talk about that as said. Um, after the nomination process, that's when our office works behind the scenes again, that's when the selection window happens. That's when we're actually matching faces to spaces. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a very timely uh, process, which all three of us work. And um, Sergeant Tabor also has his own process, if you want to piggyback on that later. Or... Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, absolutely. Um, so like she was saying, we have um, the way that the process works throughout the year and the nominations, and then we go into our selections and everything. The way that um, the, the schedule runs for the like the RNLTD dates, um, I actually worked seven uh, First Sergeant Academy classes as well to try and match up throughout the year, depending on what vacancies are available with Manning across the force. Thank you. All right. So also, um, let me let me back up a little bit. So in the nomination process, once that happened, we have sent the mass roster to the MIPERS. So if you received a nomination selection, that means you met the basic eligibility criteria um, for our per first four, 
first portion of the screening. Um, so that's the, the phase we're in right now. During the actual selection window timeframe, we will also put out another MyPERS message um, stating that you were in fact selected for DSD. So you, you're not going to be hanging out there, you know, just wondering, did I get selected? Did I, did I not get selected? Now the fourth phase of the cycle is when we actually close the cycle. And that's about a month long process where we're working behind the scenes again, um, working the, the folks that might have been selected, but may have been disqualified for a certain reason, um, couldn't meet speak out requirements, um, things of that nature. Once we close the window, you will receive another notification. So if you didn't receive a selection notification and you received the closing the window, that means you are not selected. Okay. So make sure during this process, you are checking your emails. Yes. And again, you are still in the pool until you receive that uh, email notification, right? That says that you the cycle has closed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now for this cycle, um, the RNL TDs are going to be October 31st through May of 2020. And that includes um, any schooling that you're going to have to do um, for that specific AFSC. Okay. My first. So if you're not aware, we do have a page on MyPERS called the Developmental Special Duty Process. This uh, page is under the Assignments tab on MyPERS. Um, it has a lot of good information out there for you guys to use during the cycles, uh, specifically the DSD match matrix. I like the match matrix because if I want to know what we're hiring for, we go over there and it'll show exactly what positions we we're hiring for yeah. and what we're not. So you, you can know when your leadership says, hey, we need to nominate somebody, then you can say, oh, I know that they're hiring for recruiter, so. You know. Right. So the match matrix is broke down by each AFSC and each rank specific. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're out there on um, the, the MyPERS website looking at the match matrix, if it's, if, if say for instance, we're looking at an 8 alpha 100, oh, okay, well it's all blacked out. That doesn't, that means that we're not hiring for staffs or techs in that AFSC. They're only hiring for master sergeants. Um, Throughout the cycle, we also make sure that it's updated to let you know exactly where we're at. So if Sergeant Tabor is still matching for Master Sergeants, because you have to be a Master Sergeant to be a First Sergeant, it'll show matching. Um, or if he's matched completely and uh, has completed all his selection, it, the match, uh, it will say matched. But just keep in mind, just because it says match, that doesn't mean someone may not get selected. They may get dq for a specific reason. So until you see that email saying that the cycle is closed, you still may get a chance to serve as a first sergeant. Absolutely. So we actually have a few questions coming in through Facebook. Uh, one's coming in with the DSD program, if possible, how does one voluntarily apply for a special duty? Well, if you are interested, it's not a it's not a voluntary program, which we'll talk about more later. This is a nomination process. Mm -hmm. If you are interested and you know you're eligible, you meet the basic eligibility requirements. Um, you're you're interested in being a recruiter, whatever the AFSC is that you're interested. You know you can meet the speak out requirements. This is information that you need to relate to your your leadership, absolutely, and let them know. Okay, in addition to that, there's another question about ineligibility. What causes someone to be ineligible for a DSD? We'll go over that here shortly. Um, there are several factors that we'll cover. Um, it's, we have the basic eligibility requirements for DSD that um, you have to meet right up front to even be part of the nomination poll. And we also have the speak out requirements for each AFSC that you have to be able to meet. Which is very important, so we're going to make sure you, you dig into the speak at and make sure that you are qualified. Absolutely. And lastly, as far as the questions that we have currently in the queue, if I have an assignment overseas, will the DSD take precedence and cancel the overseas assignment? Um, to, okay, so if you already have an assignment on file, for instance, if um, you're in the overseas cycle, I, I, I would have to look at your record just to see what kind of assignment it is. But typically, if you have an assignment on file, 
other than a short tour with um, a follow-on, um, we won't consider you for the DSD. You know, if you're overseas, you're eligible. If you're DROS, this is within um, our report and uh, date. So if you have a DROS of October 2018 to May 2020, you will be eligible. We'll look at you, and um, then we'll work on getting your assignment if you're selected. Great, thank you. So we also have a number of other questions. However, a number of them are very specific to individual requirements. And if we do not get to your question during the webcast, uh, just please be patient. We'll be able to address you uh, either in this Facebook post or we will reach out to you via email. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, just to continue on with um, our MyPERS webpage, because I'm super excited about it. Um, once we do have the selection roster, the final selection roster, like no joke, this is who we've hired for DSD, we will also post that out on MyPERS. Um, one, it should, it should come roughly about a week before we do the actual closing message. And just keep in mind, too, when we uh, put that uh, selection roster up there, it's tentatively selected because you still have to pass this PCAT requirement. So um, people are constantly being queued, especially MTOs and uh, MTIs and recruiters for that. So. Right. I wanted to add to that, too, like um, Sergeant Haynes was talking about with the, uh, with the way that the notifications come out through the process, whether you were nominated, whether you were selected. Make sure you pay close attention to the verbiage that is in those messages because some people can get that a little confused as to whether they were actually selected for the DSD and actually going to go and attend school or if they were just nominated and sent forward to the DSD team. Uh, so be very clear on that. If you have questions, you know, you talk to your, um, your squadron leadership or, um, you know, wing leadership to get that info. Definitely. All right, just continue on. I'm almost done. Um, also, we add on the MyPERS website, we have our PSDG. That's used as a guide for you and your leadership to use during the process. It's a, it's a breakdown step by step um, just for your information and I highly recommend you go out and pull it and I'll talk about where we can locate that out here just shortly. Um, we also have the SpeedCat out on our MyPERS website and uh, the stabilized tour guide which specifies the tour lengths for each of the eight series AFSCs. Now also to caveat on that, we do have an awesome page that uh, we have gotten set up by our PA here at AFPC. Um, it's the AFPC DSD website. And can you pull that up for them and show them Mr. Caroline? That I can. So in order to do this, we have to take a short break from the live cast, then I'll move over to the website, and then from the website we'll begin to address those. Uh, so those are currently on the, on the webcast. Please be patient. We'll be opening up a, another window within a moment, and then we'll go directly to the AFPC PA website. Sorry about that. We weren't able to um, pull up some stuff that I wanted to show you. Um, anyways, this is a great tool for your use. Um, highly recommend you go out there and take full advantage of all the information that PAs provided that we've provided on my purse. Um, Again, it has the PSDG or the the the, the speed cat, um, the PSDG guide. Um, highly recommend before you talk to leadership, make sure you are reviewing the speak uh, the speed cat to make sure that you meet the eligibility criteria. Um, speaking of eligibility criteria for nomination. So we put stomped eligibility a lot. We had some questions about eligibility, so I'll go over it a little bit more. The DSD is staff sergeant through master, and you have to make sure you're able to obtain enough retainability through the end of the DSD tour. And you'll know that the tour is by looking into uh, to look at the stabilized tour guide, which is also on our my first page. If you, we talked about it before, if you have a, a follow on we'll work with your if you're selected, we'll work with your assignment CEO to uh, to figure out. Uh, to get that gone and get you at your DSC so assignment. A release. Mm -hmm. Yes, a career field release. Just make sure your EPRs are good. You have to have, and we look at your last three, so if it's, if it's under the old system, you have to have a five. If it's under the new system, it's ACLC. And, and um, can I piggyback on that? Um, if you know there's something in your record, say for instance, we look at your last three EPRs. If your third EPR was a four or or less, but you know you're about to get your uh, new EPR on top, which will make you eligible for DSD. Make sure you relate that to your um, you relate that to your leadership 
because we see it all the time. Um, and the nomination window is the time to be looking at your records to make sure everything is good to go. Yes, and we make sure also, you know, a lot of us procrastinators, so we wait to the last second to extend or re-enlist. Um, but the system flips each record status 20, which to us when we're pulling your records, it looks like they're not going to stay in the military anymore, so you're automatically uh, uh, ineligible for DSD. Mm -hmm. So just make sure that if you are serious about wanting to be in uh, DSD, that you make sure that if you know that you're due to extend and re-enlist, you do that prior to uh, the nomination and the uh, prior to starting our selections. So that we don't say, oh, he's versus as 20 and they're not going to join, they're not going to be in the Air Force anymore, so we're not going to look at him. Um, also make sure that your PT has to be 75 or above. Mm -hmm. No PT failures within the past 12 months and make sure you have no uh, exemptions, PT exemptions. We, if you do, we can always do inception of policy, but it'll, it'll base, uh, is case by case. By case. case. Mm -hmm. um, all right, and just make sure no disciplinary action that results in Article 15 or UIF in the past three years. I wanted to add to that real quick too. So we know all of this criteria goes across of, um, you know, the nomination nomination eligibility criteria that we have in the SPCAD and the, and the PSDG. Uh, it's all out there, right? Everybody knows they have to meet these, but your leadership also understands that life happens. Um, you're going to have things that may have happened in your past. You may have had that four on an EPR whenever. Uh, or, you know, not meeting the, the AC or LC uh, criteria, or like she said, the PT fail or whatever the case, make sure that, you know, if you really are um, interested in one of these and you know you've been performing well, your leadership knows you've been performing well, make sure to still get that good push because your leadership can still try and address that. And like she mentioned, you know, there's uh, exceptions of policy. So um, at the end of the day, we want the, the most highly skilled performers in these positions to support our airmen. Definitely. Um, uh, other nomination and criteria, uh, eligibility criteria. Again, just make sure you're getting into the SPCAT. If you, it's a nomination process a program. However, if you are interested, you always can communicate. Because, like Dr. Tampa said, we want people who want to be here. Um, so, if you are interested in something, make sure you look at the SPCAT and know that you uh, are eligible, and then look out your leadership. We see during our our process when we hire people. Mm -hmm. you know, Sergeant Bocchieri and I were going there and looking at everybody's information and seeing if you are good. What, what do we usually see? We see a lot of people, um, if you're a recruiter, if you want to be a recruiter, you have to be a second term airman. So a lot of people- first term airman, second term airman. Yeah, so there's a lot, we need to keep a lot of people because they mm -hmm. were nominated for their first term. Mm -hmm. It was an MT, MT, MTIs, if you're a staff sergeant, you have to have 24 months right. time and grade. Mm -hmm. So just make sure you know that too. So all the specifics, like we were saying, um, make sure you're looking at that speed cut. All the specifics will be there. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna move on to the commander's nomination piece. So last week, we just sent out the nomination roster to your leadership. So hopefully by now you've received an email saying that you were potential, you, you know, you were nominated. And if you wasn't, then you need to make sure you're communicating with your leadership so maybe they can possibly add you to the nomination. That needs to happen before we start matching, okay? So the commanders, they received the following in this email that we sent just last week, okay? They, they received the DSD nomination instructions. They also received the PSD guide dated 25 April, 2019. They also received the MatchCom nomination roster, the local hire rack and stack template, and the master spring local hire requirements and CFM releases. Okay, so they've received all of this information in that email that we sent last week. So we have a suspense on them for, for June. Am I correct? For June? Suspense is for June. So right now is the time to be communicating with your leadership. They're going to be nominated whoever they need to at this time frame, okay? 30 days. Remember, it's 30 days. And during this time frame, um, they're going to start communicating with you all. And um, what they're going to be looking for, well, what we're going to be looking for is at least one vector per nominee, okay? But you can send up two. It all depends on the match comp. So let's say you really want to be an MTI, okay? And you mm, not too sure, but you might want to try recruiter. Your primary needs to be number one. That MTI, that needs to be in your number, number one spot because that's what we're going to go and match first, okay? 
So once we've selected you for the MTI, we won't look at the second vector for you. So make sure that that is what you really, you know, would like to do. Okay. So I'll so, make sure that second vector, if you want to second vector, something you want to do too, because absolutely. Um, if if we are hiring for MTIs and we have exhausted all means for the first vector, then we're going to go and look at everybody who's in a second vector of MTI, and then we'll start hiring that. So even though it's 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 more likely for you to get hired in your primary vector, mm -hmm. then make sure it's still something that you want to do in your second vector. Absolutely. And also, um, we see this happen as well. So your MagCom may require you to submit two vectors. So once we make our selection, um, our office receives phone calls. Well, my first vector was MTI, but um, and my second was MTL. I really want to be an MTI. How come I um, I am not an, I didn't uh, I got picked up for MTL. Your MagCom also has the option mm -hmm. to just submit you for for one vector and it might have been your second choice just to to keep that in mind as well good point good point okay so um like i was mentioning earlier let's say you're not on you didn't receive that nomination email you're you wasn't on the roster but you're eligible and you would like to be a part of this dsv program um that's where we have this is the opportunity now to get your name added to the list okay keep in mind that list is pulled and it's snap, uh, you know, takes a just a snapshot of time from when we pulled it. So anything could have happened to make you eligible if you if you weren't eligible at the time we pulled it. And same with being ineligible. So just keep that in mind too. Um, also, I want to talk about uh, airmen that are previously serving in a DSV position. So let's say they're previously serving in a DSV position. They are MTI. They love it. Um, and they're like, can I stay? Well, no, what we would need you to do is go back to your primary AFSC for at least three years. Okay, after that, then you will have another opportunity to come back and possibly do MTI again or do another DSD. Okay. And, and that, that's a really good um, uh, point, too. I was previously a readiness NCO as an H Charlie, and um, I served my time there, and I had to go back to my primary AFSC for a little while before I actually got selected to be a diamond wearer. So, uh, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, absolutely. So just keep that in mind for the future. So um, as far as the wing commanders, they're going to be the only ones to um, be that approval authority to remove an individual from BSD. We know that there are hardship reasons that come up or what have you, but that is the only approval authority to be removed from this program. I also want to Foot stomp that this is a nominative program, not a volunteer. I know we I remember hearing about it earlier. How can we volunteer? This is not a, a volunteer program. This is a nominative program, but it's important for you to communicate with your leadership if this is something that you are interested in. And also to piggyback on that, um, time on station is a factor. However, if your commander feels that you are the best fit, for one of these eight series AFSCs, just I just want to foot stomp it. We will work on working a time on station waiver. Um, so if for some reason you didn't show up on, uh, you didn't get a, no a nomination notification for whatever the case may be, please have your leadership reach out to us. That way we can get you added if you meet all the eligibility criteria. Um, during the nomination process, again, is the time to get added. We do not add after we've already made our selections. All right, so now we're going to move on to the airman's responsibility. So if you're watching and um, this is something that you would like to do, like we keep stressing in this topic, um, communication is the key. So make sure you are communicating, communicate, 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 one way or another. You, some you're interested, some you're not interested in, because what we want to do is select the best of the best for these positions. Okay. So if you want to serve, like we said, make sure you're communicating with your leadership. Immediately notify the NPS to make sure that your information, like your EPRs and all that good stuff, is good to go. Okay? Make sure that you're eligible. Um, for the airmen that are selected, so we have, they will have 30 days from being um, selected to get their application into their screening team. Okay? And that is the time frame where you may get DQ'd. Okay? Or you may or may not. 
So just make sure that you're sticking to that uh, suspense and getting whatever information, documents, whatever you need done in that 30-day uh, window. Um, like I said before, ensure that your EPRs, reenlistments, our Mr. brought up earlier about reenlistment. Don't wait to the last minute. Make sure you go ahead and get your reenlistments, extensions, get that stuff taken care of, okay? Um, and uh, as far as being vulnerable, you will, like we mentioned earlier, that you're going to be vulnerable until you get that email saying that the cycle has closed. There is always going to be a possibility. We, we stressed as far as DQs, the rates are high, so make sure that you, you know, hey, I didn't see anything, it's okay. You may still have an opportunity to serve in one of these DSD positions. And to um, piggyback on that, if you don't get selected up front, you're not notified, whatnot, but you see an equal plus ad in your primary AFSC you really want to do, um, or you, you are, you're in your BOP window, whatever the case may be, there's another voluntary opportunity for you. Just because you're still vulnerable for DSD doesn't make you ineligible for those other programs. Um, we work directly with your functional assignment managers here at AFPC. Um, you know, we want to we want to work out what's best for the airmen. Um, so if you do have another opportunity, make sure you know to let your leadership know. That way, we can work with your your assignment NCOs here at AFPC to get you taken off the DSD list. Absolutely, great point. Great point. All right, so assignment selection. All right, moving into the assignment selection, the good stuff. <laughs> Okay, again, we foot stomp this. You must be nominated by your commander for consideration. This also includes local hires. Um, you, you, might, you, you might see the ad out there for a local hire, um, but we have to make sure that you were actually nominated for uh, DSD. Okay, um, again, you have to have a career field manager release, and we'll talk more about that here in a little bit. Um, Caveat, first vector is always looked at first. Mm -hmm. um, if exhausted in that AFSC, we will move to your first, your second vector. Okay. Um, oh, joint spouse is a big one. Um, we will coordinate with your assignment functional prior to the actual assignment selection to make sure that your spouse can join you. Um, and we, we work that behind the scenes here with um, your FAMS for each AFSC. I mean, Absolutely. We, we haven't had any. So just keep in mind, your intent codes are what you want them to be, because we're going to look at the intent codes. If your spouse has an H, we're going to select. We're not even going to look at the next. So make sure you're communicating with your spouse and making sure if y'all want to be together that your intent codes match. And also communicating your spouse, if um, you know you're, you're nominated and this is something you want to do, if your spouse has a code 50, which keeps them where they're at, where you're, and your code is a A or B, we're not going to end up selecting you because you can, your spouse can't leave and we want to keep you guys together. Absolutely. So make sure that you are, are both on the same page and make sure both records are good to go. And then also to include, we have um, had in the past where both spouses are selected for mm -hmm. USD. Yep. So keep that in mind. So we are going to, you know, do what we can to keep you together. One may be an MTI at Lackland, the other way may be a recruiter at Lackland. So just keep that in mind. If you're both selected, we'll do our very best to get you all nominated. Okay, thank you. And I do got one more thing. I just, an example. Um, we did have, a, I believe it was a recruiter that got selected, and his assignment was to Fargo, North Dakota, and I believe he was a volunteer for that. Um, his spouse was security forces. Well, if we can't get you guys within 50 miles of each other, then we're not even going to consider for that location. That's when we would have to go back and work with the assignment team and the screening team to get you located to um, a location within 50 miles of each other for joint spouse. Mm -hmm. Something else I wanted to add real quick before we flip past um, assignments. I think it's a misperception out in the, out in the field that um, if you know, you're wanting to do a, one of the A-series DSDs, and I'll talk from my first sergeant perspective real quick, I place a lot of uh, equal plus ads for positions that are around the Air Force, uh, overseas and in the CONUS. Um, 
when it comes to being selected for first sergeant, I believe a lot of people think that they can go on to one of those equal plus ads to a vacancy that's advertised out there and whatever AFSC they're in, and they can volunteer for that equal plus ad for 8F and think they're going to get selected and then I'll send them to the academy and then they'll go and be a first sergeant in that unit. That's, that's not how that happens. So, and I see them every week with all the equal plus ads. I'll have two alphas, three papas, three, three fox trots always applying for jobs for ADF positions that, you know, they don't already, they don't meet the criteria because their AFSC doesn't align. So again, you know, we go back to the nomination and selection piece of this. Make sure that you're, you're nominated and you're, and you're selected and you're proactive and letting your leadership know, like she said, um, to try and get selected because the equal plus ad is not going to be the, the, the way to, to go through that selection. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. All right, continuing on. Um, the, the assignment selection is a little different for um, each AFSC. For MTLs, for sergeants, and recruiters, once selected, you will receive an email notification that you have been selected for those AFSCs. That email notification will kickstart your SPECAT requirements. From That is your official notification. So once you get that official notification, that's when day one starts for the SPECAT requirements. Um, all other AFSCs are going to be notified via the virtual MPF or the commander, the, the normal seven-day notification process. Um, Make sure when you start the SPECAT, if you were nominated but you didn't want to be nominated, you still need to do that SPECAT because if, it's, if nothing is turned into a screening team, we're going to get with your uh, wing leadership, and then bring you with your uh, NASHCOM leadership, and it's going to keep ch uh, channeling up. So make sure if, if you think, if you don't answer that email, you're not going to get selected, your, your leadership is going to get involved. You're still required to complete the requirements for the DSD process. Okay, um, again, each AFSC has unique hiring requirements. Uh, if a waiver for a SPCAT requirement or training is required, that will be done by the AFP, uh, AFSC POC. Mm -hmm. Might be us here at AFPC or um, the recruiting team. Um, it just depends on what kind of waiver it is. Um, again, retainability. You must be able to get the three to four year tour length depending on the AFSC. And you must be able to have the PCS um, retainability for 24 months at least. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dante, would you have anything to add on the, on the for, uh, for Sergeant? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, for mine specifically, whenever I start to go through, you know, I receive the, um, the, the nomination rosters and all the names from everybody, and then I can start my selections. When I start going through those, I compile a full list of names, and I start to look to fill up the classes for that cycle, where, whether it's four for the spring cycle or three for the fall cycle. Uh, once I work through those and I've gotten everybody aligned with a certain um, uh, class date, I will try to make sure that that class date aligns with their zeros. Uh, and after that, I'll actually send a list to all the MAGCOM command first sergeants and they filter them out through every command. Uh, and then later on in the process, a week later, I will be doing my notifications, as you mentioned. Um, that gives the, the leadership. Uh, at the base level, you know, the wing and the squadron, the squadron commander is the one that nominated. It gives them an opportunity to give them the first-hand notification. And I believe myself, I would rather hear it from the person that nominated me from, from just me sending an email saying, hey, congratulations, right? Uh, while me sending that email might be great, uh, your, your leadership team uh, would love to be able to do that themselves. So, uh, and then once, once they're done, I'll start working on filling up those classes and then um, and work assignments from there on once the, uh, the applications are received at that point. So, yeah. Good information. All right, so we've, we've uh, just covered a little bit about the assignment selection. Now, assignment selection portion's over. What the closing process looks like for us. We get a lot of email traffic, phone calls. Why wasn't I selected? Um, so I'm just going to cover, cover a few things of um, the main reasons why people don't get selected for DSD, okay? So initially, when I first talked about phase one, getting the CFM releases, whatnot, when we do our initial eligibility poll, we pull about anywhere between 20 to 25,000 eligible personnel. 
um, Air Force wide. So that's what our big number looks like initially when um, we start uh, the, the cycle. So behind the scenes again, we're doing a lot of eligibility checks and it's a manual process. Um, we get that roster down anywhere between 15 to 20,000. That roster is then broke up into match comps, divvied out to each match comp for the nomination process. Now keep in mind, we're dealing with anywhere between 15 to 20,000 eligibles, but we're only hiring 1,000 vacancies this cycle. So out of those you know, 15 to 20,000, we're only selecting uh, 1,013. So that's one of the big factors why people don't get selected for DSD. Um, and again, um, just because you're not initially selected doesn't mean that you won't. Um, there is still an option. Once we start the closing process, um, people are constantly being DQ'd. Um, hardships come up. They're taken out of the DSD cycle. Um, but until you receive that final notification that the cycle's closed, then um, there's still an opportunity for you to be selected. Another reason why some people aren't selected is because we have CFM releases, so we'll reach out to your CFMs and um, say for personnel, our CFM may give us 10 releases for a tech sergeant. Uh, so we can have you know 100 tech sergeants and different personnel nominated, mm -hmm. but um. But then as soon as we get those, we use those 10, then no, everybody else at the personnel are not eligible. Um, but we'll still keep you in the pool because if somebody is DQ'd that was a uh, personnel, then it'll open up a position for somebody else to be looked at. Um, then this tire, your higher tenure restricted or um, people, SRBs, if you have SRB, you have to have met 50% or more before you can, um, serve in a, a DSD and you'll have to sign a waiver and that waiver needs to be sent to us during this time frame right now where we're getting nominations um, and then that's, that's all I can think of right now besides everything else is Dom, Dom, or Dom. I was going to say that you know you may have a command chief out in the field that may request hey I wanted to nominate this guy to be a first sergeant we have a vacancy here um, they may see a vacancy or they think they have a vacancy uh, we have to pull Manning and that's how we find out how many positions we need to fill around the Air Force um, so when we look at that, he may want to keep, you know, Master Sergeant um, Brown or whoever at that location, but whenever I pull it and I'm looking to hire, if I can't keep him there, one, he either can't be selected or he'll have the PCS. Uh, so you guys need to be aware of that also. So I have a question, sorry, Matt, so what about pregnancy? If you're pregnant, if you're in pregnancy, um, what's that, pregnancy code on you, you can still do DSD, but we'll have to um, make sure you sign your pregnancy waiver which also will need to be turned in when, when donations are turned in. So. All right, thank you. That also kind of goes with deployment too. If you have a deployment that's on the books, I'm sure we're going to talk about it, but those two are kind of hand in hand. Those are really the um, only waiverable type items that we have for, for DSD. So once again, real quick for the waivers, make sure that they're sent up during this nomination time frame. Once we start matching, if we don't have it at our level, we will DQ you. So just make sure that those waivers are signed and sent up. All right. And also with deployments, uh, you have to be back and you have to have at least 90 days. Uh, if you don't have any days from the time you get back, then you'll, we won't look at you because you need the 90 days to come back and just for the, the regular. Yeah, for the, mm -hmm. for the AFI. And um, I think that's about it. All right. We have some few questions if you have a few moments. Absolutely. Uh, one question came in. It said, I'm tentatively selected for his DSD. How much time do I have to turn in documents to the screening team? 30 days. From the date of notification. Okay. And then work with the screening team if, if, if there's delays because of medical. Or, yeah. 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 But as long as you're keeping in communication with the, the screening team. And I think we've already addressed this, but if we have any amplifying information on the uh, is joint spouse considered when members are selected? Yes. We coordinate that up front to prior to the assignment load. Mm -hmm. What avenues can individuals take to remove themselves if selected that wouldn't carry a negative impact? If a member is no longer interested in DSD, it's got to be very justifiable. Mm -hmm. um, the wing commander is the only one that can sign requesting that you're released from DSD. 
-hmm. For me specifically, once I receive those those requests uh, to be removed, those go to our uh, our career field manager for for approval. So um, while you were nominated and selected, and then we're going through the process, you want to try to pull yourself out of it. There's several things that need to happen, like she said, the wing commanders. Uh, memo, and then for me, the our special duty or career field manager has to approve that as well. Another one, Kevin. I have heard there was a change to allow any airman to be nominated regardless of TOS, DROS, or assignment selection. Is this true? Time on station rules still apply. However, we are allowing commanders to uh, to nominate people who they feel are best for the job and. If we select them, then we will waive the time on station. So commanders can nominate anybody if they feel that they are the right person for this job, and we'll we'll do the waivers. The the main focus of that really is to we want the right person in the right place, right time, right job, right. We want to make sure that if you know you you need a few months waived for time on station for any reason or any of the other waivers, you know if you're an exceptional performer and you need to be in that position, we want to try to align that. Perfect. So if we did not receive a notification, does that mean we do not meet eligibility requirements? What are the minimum requirements? Um, the minimum requirements are you got to be a staff sergeant through a master sergeant. Your last EPRs have to be a three or a, your last three EPRs have to be a five, an AC or an LC. You have to have 75% or higher on your PT test. Um, no failures within the last 12 months and no exemptions. No disciplinary action on file, such as Article 15, UIF, um, and I believe for first sergeant, don't you have the... Yeah, we, we asked for specific one-year time and grade prior to nomination. Um, you know, that was something that was added this last cycle. Um, as to capture, you know, having more experience as a senior NCO to step into being a diamond wearer, uh, it's just something that we, we felt would be best for the force, so... And I think the last question that we'll address, because the majority of them I think are either individual or require some more research to get into, is what is the earliest one can find out if they have been selected? We, well, we're, during our cycle, we're going to start matching in June. It's going to be June because the nomination ends for June. So once we start matching, the matching as a whole for every AFSC takes roughly four to six weeks, just depending on um, how fast we get people's speak out requirements back. So it, a lot of it depends on the members. Um, so roughly looking at the cycle, it should be, and bear with me, we had some hiccups. Um, I would say no earlier, no earlier than probably six weeks and yeah. no later than the end of September. Um, yeah. So if you're not, at, you know, nominate or not nominated. If you're not notified by then, uh, then you weren't selected, but it could be as early as I would say the six week period. Our goal is to close the cycle and have the closing message out no later than the end of August. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Any more closing comments? No. Thank you guys so much for uh, joining us today. Wonderful. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank, thank you for you joining know. us on this. Um, we will also be pulling this webcast off and putting it onto our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com Air Force Personnel Center. And it should be up within a day or two. Again, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to post questions here. And again, we always encourage all airmen to engage with their leadership through this process. They're your first and best engagement process to get all of your questions answered on this. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful afternoon. Ooh. Ooh. It was good, guys. Our first webcast. <laughs>